Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Threefold Lotus Kuun. Uh, Kuun is an ancient Chinese term meaning place of, sacred place, if you will, of practice and study. So this is the school, the TLK school, following the Nichiren school of Lotus Sutra Buddhism, as taught by Shakyamuni. Blah, what a mouthful. Thanks for being here. Thanks for your support. Thanks for liking, subscribing. Uh, it helps promote the channel, and that's important to grow our Sangha. It's a Bodhisattva activity, so thank you for that. Uh, thank you, patrons. Just got a new patron. Uh, thank you, Catalina. Uh, thank you, all of you, who, whether you like and subscribe or you can donate uh, financial support for this endeavor, it's tremendously appreciated, not just by me, but all of us, because it helps keep this flow of information going to inspire confidence in our practice, yeah? Uh, we are going to, I'm going to read the penultimate uh, Go Show in this collection, in this book of the profound meanings of the Daimoku, a collection of uh, Nichiren's writings specifically relating to the Daimoku, which is our primary question when we start practicing, right? So I saw a need for doing a collection like this to focus study because if you start, if you dive into the deep end of study, it's just, there's so much. It's hard to focus. It's hard to feel cohesive about what you're studying. Uh, for the same reason, I just put together the book and I'm still waiting for my proof, proof copy, although you can get it now um, on the Letters to Women, uh, Nietzsche and Gosho. So I did, that's like a 400-page book, has, um, and it's large print, so it's easy to read. It's not like that rice paper stuff that's hard to read. Um, but... Sometimes, it, you know, this, the teachings, they span 3,000 years, so they tend to be very male-centric, yeah? But there's one thing about Lotus Sutra Buddhism specifically, and Nichiren points this out, as, as does Shakyamuni, that a sentient mind has no sex. It's not male or female or anything in between. It's a sentient mind. And so talk about dem democratic equal uh, equanimity uh, women you ladies have just the same potential as any man to attain enlightenment but when you study all these old teachings this history of teachings it's very male centric so i thought it might for you ladies i might just bolster that teaching of buddhism and uh, I did my best to assemble all of the letters that Nichiren wrote to women in medieval Japan. And uh, one thing I noticed is that the questions and answers and replies and even the Nichiren's dialogue, first of all, women's questions are a little different. And in fact, they're in a way, much more relatable to anyone who's practicing Buddhism because ladies ask questions without fear of not asking the right question. They just they hit the nail on the head. And Nietzsche takes the opportunity very compassionately and scholarly to answer those questions, and they turn out to be very nurturing to our practice. Who would have thought? So as I put that book together, I thought, wow, this is really, I don't know if I should call this Letters to Women. I might call this the Essential Teachings for Beginners and Intermediate Practitioners. And then I thought, well, this is really for everyone. It's just there's a different character to those Go Show. I really liked it. And I thought, you know, a lot of ladies out there are going to be practicing Buddhism or looking into Buddhism, and they're going to think, this is just for men. Well, I don't want you to think that. 
Buddhism is for everyone, any sentient mind. So I thought maybe this will serve a good purpose, a, a supportive purpose. So I put the book together, Letters to Women, Nietzsche and Gosho, available on lulu.com, right, at spotlight uh, slash kwoon, K-W-O-O-N. And then I thought I should make it available as an ebook as well. So you can go to threefoldlotus.com, and I believe I put it on there. Yeah, I'm quite sure. So you can actually download it as an ebook or PDF. I'm not sure. I think they make an ebook out of those. Not sure. Either way, you can download it and read it on your computer, on your device, whatever. I'm not fond of that for myself. I don't like reading off a screen. I like a paper book. But for a lot of you, especially our international friends, much more simple to get an electronic, a digital version. And then you can print out, you know, pieces as you like. And you own it. Rather than shipping, international fees, blah, 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 blah. It gets really expensive. Book, publishing, trees, wood, paper, pulp, ink. <laughs> it's just, you know, everything gets more and more expensive. So just to make the teaching more accessible, keep the price way down, uh, I thought the ebooks or the digital versions would be really helpful to propagate, to spread the teachings, yeah? All right, so King Rinda. This is, our, as I said, our penultimate go show in this book. I'm already stressing about what the next <laughs> book is. Uh, I've been reading this book uh, of, uh, oh, this is an old book that f uh, f one of you gave me. It's a talk on Nietzsche and Shonen's, and there it is, Object of Worship. Terrible translation. It's not what it is. Objective of Renge, maybe. We talked about that in previous videos. By Reverend Tetsujo Kabota. Kubota. Translated by uh, Graham Lamont. Uh, Sankibo Buddhist Bookstore Limited, Hongo, Tokyo, Japan, 1994. Uh, oh, lots of terrible Western rhetoric in here. And yet, some handy little translations of Japanese words from Nietzsche's writings that I found quite elucidating. So, I'm on the fence on this one. I'm not sure if I want to struggle with all that translatory ridiculousness. But at the same time, it might be a source of interesting information. But today we're reading King Rinda, so let's get to it. It begins. I have received the two sacks of parched rice you sent. Rice may, be, may seem like a very small thing, yet it is what sustains human life. And the Buddha says that life is something that cannot be purchased even for the price of an entire major world system. Rice is what sustains life, it, certainly in medieval Japan, yeah? It is like the oil that sustains the life of the lamp. Interesting analogy. The Lotus Sutra is a lamp. The Myoho Renge Kyo is a lamp. And its votary is the oil that sustains it. You and I being promulgators of the Lotus Sutra, examples, influences with our life condition, radiating into our environment, leading people toward the investigation and the investment in their own enlightenment, we are the oil of the lamp. Bodhisattva. Hmm? Or again, the lay supporters are the oil that sustains the lamp of the votary. So you and I are sustaining one another and those endeavoring to propagate formally the teachings of the Lotus Sutra, yeah? So Nietzsche makes quite a point of, again, as I pointed out last time, this offering of rice isn't about feeding Nietzsche. It is, but that's not what it's about. 
It's about the propagation of the teachings, the value of propagating the teachings. And certainly, as the votary, Nichiren, being the voice of propagation in medieval Japan, keeping him sustained isn't about keeping our buddy Nichiren fed. It's about keeping our buddy Nichiren healthy so that he can perform the work of propagation, votary of the Lotus Sutra. Hmm? Among all the hundreds flavors, the flavor of cow's milk is the finest. Okay. The seventh volume of the Nirvana Sutra says, quote, of all flavors, the finest is that of milk, end quote. When milk is treated, it becomes cream. And when cream is treated, it eventually becomes ghee. Of the five flavors represented by this process, ghee is the finest, the most refined, yes? If we employ these five flavors as similes for the various Buddhist teachings, we might say that the 3,000 volumes of the Confucian school and the 18 major scriptures of Brahmanism correspond to the flavors of ordinary foods. They're nurturing, but they're, they're limited in their capacity to elevate. They just keep you going. They're sustenance. In comparison to these, even the Agama Sutras are like the flavor of ghee. When you compare, in other words, those regular non-Buddhist teachings to even the earliest Hinayana teachings, the earliest teachings of Buddha, they're like ghee. They're the most refined thing, right? Among all the Buddhist teachings, the Agama Sutras may be compared to the flavor of milk when you encompass all of the teachings of Shakyamuni's lifetime. The meditation and the other sutras of the correct and equal period may be compared to the flavor of cream. They're more refined, right? The wisdom sutras may be compared to the flavor of curdled milk, like yogurt. The flower garland sutra may be compared to the flavor of butter. And the immeasurable meanings, lotus and nirvana sutras, may be compared to the flavor of ghee. They're the most refined. Hmm? Again, if the Nirvana Sutra is compared to the flavor of ghee, then the Lotus Sutra may be compared to a Lord who rules over the five flavors. Thus, the great teacher Miao Lo stated, quote, If we discuss the matter from the point of view of the doctrines taught, then the Lotus Sutra stands as the true Lord of all the teachings, since it alone preaches opening the provisional and revealing the distant. This is the reason that it alone is permitted the word myo, or wonderful, in its title. He also said, quote, Therefore we understand that the Lotus Sutra is the true Lord of the Gi. So that's interesting. It's the, the final Mahayana teachings are like the Gi, the most refined, but the Lotus Sutra specifically is like the maker of the Gi, right? Because the Gi won't make itself. Interesting, right? Self-manifesting Buddhahood, self-realization, Lotus Sutra. It takes effort, and therefore the effort must be committed by Someone, a sentient mind. These passages of commentary point out quite rightly that the Lotus Sutra is not to be included amongst the five flavors. The main import of these passages is that the five flavors serve to nourish life, but life itself is Lord over all the five flavors. That there is something to feed. The food is a wonderful thing, but if the food exists without a purpose, then of what use is it? Hmm? 
The Tendai School puts forth two views on this matter. The first is that the flower garland, correct and equal, wisdom, nirvana, and lotus sutras are all comparable to the flavor of ghee. This view would seem to be based on the opinion that the sutras preached previous to the Lotus Sutra and the Lotus Sutra itself are similar in nature. The scholars of the world are familiar only with, the partic uh, with this particular view and are not familiar with the doctrine that the Lotus Sutra is the Lord of the Five Flavors. Hence, they are deceived and led astray by the other schools of Buddhism. They don't see the relative values of the different teachings. They just group them all together as one, right? And the Lord could be, instead of using the word Lord, you could use the word chef. When a chef walks into a kitchen, he doesn't see every ingredient and spice and meat or, or vegetable as equal. He understands they all have their place but they all have their place in a series leading to the, right? The, there's the appetizer, there's the main course, there's the dessert. They all have their place. A chef knows this, right? So you could say the chef is the lord of the kitchen, okay? Okay. The view that although the lotus and other sutras differ with regard to whether or not they open up and incorporate the expedient means, they all represent the perfect teaching. This is a doctrine that reflects the meaning of the theoretical teaching. However, the view that the various sutras mentioned above correspond to the five flavors, while the lotus sutra represents the chef, the lord the, of the five flavors, this is a doctrine that reflects the essential teaching. So you see what he's, he's leading to here is even within the Lotus Sutra itself, there's this division. Hmm? This doctrine was touched upon by Tendai and Miao Lo in their writings, but it was not actually clearly enunciated. This is why there are few scholars who are aware of it. In the passage of the commentary by Miao Lo, quoted above, the words, quote, if we discuss the matter from the point of view of the doctrines taught, refer to the Daimoku, or title of the Lotus Sutra, which is what is meant by, quote, the doctrines taught. The words opening the provisional, quote-unquote, correspond to the character gay in the five-character daimoku of Myoho-Renge-kyo. The words revealing the distant correspond to the character Ren in the five-character daimoku. The words it alone is permitted the word Myo corresponds to the character Myo. And the words, this is the reason, refer to the fact that when we speak of the Lotus Sutra as the essence of the lifetime teachings of the Buddha, of Shakyamuni Buddha, we have in mind the Daimoku of the Lotus Sutra. Therefore, one should understand that the Daimoku of the Lotus Sutra represents the essence of Of all the sutras, it represents the eye of all the sutras. The Lotus Sutra should be, should by rights be employed in eye-opening ceremonies to ensure their effectiveness. This is why when we enshrine our mandala, and there are instructions on this freely available on threefoldlotus.com on enshrining your mandala of Gohanzon that we do a gongyo because we are offering the eye, the opening of our Gohanzon mind by enshrining this mandala 
to lead us to it, to reflect our mind's consciousnesses on Gohonzon. This is why we perform a gangyo when we enshrine a mandala. Logical, right? But instead of that, the Mahavarachana and other sutras are employed in eye-opening ceremonies for all various wooden or painted images of the Buddhas. Because they're not, they're, they don't understand the distinctive difference of self-manifesting Gohanzun, Buddhahood. They're all involved in rituals. And those rituals are not the point of Buddhism. As a result, none of the Buddha images in the temples and padieta, uh, padietyas of Japan, though their forms resemble that of the Buddha, are really Buddhas in mind. They're just ideas about Buddhism. They're not the actual practice. Rather, they have the minds of ordinary beings who live in the nine worlds. The custom of revering ignorant teachers as though they were wise men began this way. People were duped by these colorful, even if they had good intent in their, in their hearts, they had poor understanding and they multiplied that poor understanding with their ignorance and the people not learning, not knowing to seek beyond them just followed along. This is how authoritarianism works throughout history, throughout history in the world. And Nietzsche is pointing it out back in medieval Japan. He's saying, over and over again, we have these great Bodhisattva scholars, Narajuna, Vasubandhu, Tendai, Miaolo, many others, who want to rise, raise up your thinking about what it is to practice Buddhism, and yet they all get folded into just the ritualistic, aren't we wonderful people? Look, let's all gather, let's all, let's all bring our ambrosia and sponge cakes and celebrate that we're Buddhists without ever getting to the, the actual work of enlightenment. And Nichiren, in his day, sees this throughout Japan, sees the cultures of Japan degrading, sees the suffering going on in people, and the actual threat to the sovereignty of the nation. And he sees very clearly why this is happening. And the dumbfounded look of leaders and, and, and uh, peasants alike who are like, what's happening? Because they simply don't know that they're not practicing correctly. Practicing in this sense isn't just practicing Buddhism. It isn't just chanting and doing gangyo. It isn't just practicing the clear teachings of the Lotus Sutra. It's practicing life. Understand that every breath we take, everything we do, day to day, is an expression of our potential. And what is Buddhism about? Expressing fully, clearly, that potential in its maximal form, in its most life-affirming, most Buddha form. So there's no separation. It isn't, I live and then I practice. Right? We talked about this recently. This is how our practice informs our daily life. We aim for, endeavor for, make effort to enlighten our minds. That's it. That's what the Buddhist practice is for. But that Buddhist practice of enlightening our sentient mind, how can it not change the nature of everything we experience? And influence everything we experience? How can our environment not mirror that effort? Oh. Hmm? 
Be the chef. Don't be the ingredient. How silly. Seems obvious, right? Such practices simply waste the funds of the nation. Funds being energy. They do not produce effective meditations, effective efforts. On the contrary, the Buddhas are thereby transformed. They turn into devil or negative, non, non, uh, life unaffirming, and demons. This is what is causing distress to the ruler of the nation and the common people. He's stating exactly what I was just saying, right? I said it ahead of him. And now because the votary of the Lotus Sutra and his lay supporters have appeared, somebody who's clearly getting what Shakyamuni Buddha was teaching, what Buddha Ness is making clear, right? Aside from Shakyamuni, our enlightenment makes this obvious. People behave like the many kinds of ordinary beasts who hate the Lion King or like the plants and trees that tremble before an icy wind. But I will put that aside for now. So he's referring to his many, the many attacks that have been made on his life, on his incarceration. People fear like they fear the great lion, not because the lion is any less great, but instead of revering the lion, they're all scared for their own. So they demonize and cast aspersions on the lion, which is silly. Respect the lion, understand what the lion is, and live in accordance, right, with that order. But spitting on the lion doesn't protect you. It's, that's an arrogant, childish thing to do. So he's equating that kind of silliness with the behavior of the people and how they're casting aspersions on Nietzsche, right? Or anyone who upholds Myohorengekyo. Why is the Lotus Sutra superior to other sutras? Why is it beneficial for all living beings? To illustrate, the plants and trees have the earth as their mother, the sky as their father, and the sweet rains as their food their nourishment. The wind and their spirit, as their spirit, and the sun and moon as their wet nurses. And in this way they grow to maturity, bring forth flowers, and bear fruit. In the same manner, all living beings have the true aspect of all phenomena, the engine of life, as their earth, this is our essence. When we see the word essence or badly translated as soul, we're not talking about a, a package of you-ness, an identity. See, that's a samsaric delusion. We're talking about the process that actually manifests the formations of life which we become completely in concert with when we chant Namo Myoden Gekyo. That is the earth, the, the equated earth of, right, the bodhisattvas for beneath the earth. You see this analogy is very consistent. I mean, the truth has as their earth, yeah, the aspect-free nature as their sky. Aspect-free nature. What does he mean by that? It means that you're not preformed. You're not a soul, in other words. Your instantiations, your manifestation from moment to moment to moment is of potential, and potential has no limitations. Hmm. The one vehicle as their sweet rain, 
So what feeds our existence is Myoho Renge Kyo. Why is that? Is that because those are magic words? Is that because the Lotus Sutra is what fed humanity all along? No, 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 no. Don't misunderstand. The Myoho Renge Kyo is the energy of life. It is the law from which all phenomena form. And so knowing that law, that consciousness, that's, that awareness isn't itself the source. It is our window to witnessing and understanding that source. That source is the source. It's the energy of life. It's the universe. It's what all phenomena are manifest of potential, right? Our recognizing that spectacular engine of life, that's not something else. It's something our minds are capable of witnessing. That is the great privilege of being alive, having a sentient mind. Hmm? And the pronouncement that the Lotus Sutra is foremost among all the sutras that the Buddha preached, now preaches, or will preach, as their great wind. In other words, there's a great nurturing of our beingness in witnessing that this is the process, right? These are like the three bodies. They all occur at once. They're just a matter of of different perspectives on the same thing. This is, there is the perception of this is, and then there is the perception of understanding that we are this ising. Does that make sense? It's all the same thing, but knowing it and incorporating that knowledge into being it it's very circular. It's a tight little circle. But it's essential that we do this in our sentient minds because without it, we just ping pong all over the room. We have no direction. We're just waiting for shit to happen. Interesting analogies. Adorn, quote, adorned with the power of meditation and wisdom, end quote, as their sun and moon, they nurture the rewards of perfect enlightenment, put forth the flowers of great pity and great compassion, and bear the fruit of peaceful Buddhahood. That's the reward body of this realization. Hmm? Such is the way that all living beings are nourished all right we will continue with this go show king rinda in the next the next episode the next installment of the profound meanings of the daimoku thank you for listening thank you for your practice don't forget to like and subscribe it's important to grow our sangha, and it's a bodhisattva act, yeah, for that same reason. Um, ow, hair is on the neck. Um, yes, as always, uh, we're all supremely grateful for your participation. Don't forget to use this resource to the max. There's a video on the home page of this channel that that helps you understand how to use the search within this site, not the YouTube search, and the, the other uh, resources that, uh, for your edification, free, threefoldrose.com, links to the bookstore and the mandala store, um, all different ways you can help to support this effort to keep this resource going and alive. Um, but most of all, most importantly, please, be confident in your practice, right? Don't just do this as a habit. Do it as life itself, your maximal potential. 
it's important. You're important. So thank you. Thank you for your practice. And I'll see you in the next one, okay? Be, be good to yourself. Take care of your health. That means being kind. Oh, no. Yeah. That's a good thing. To yourself first. Right? You can't help others if you don't help yourself. Namo Myoden Gekyo. Bye for now. Myo. <laughs>